Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jim Blaney uh, with our ITSM product marketing team. I'm glad you could join us. Uh, this is the second in a series of our Meet the Expert series. We have quite a few lined up for you, so appreciate you guys taking the time uh, to, uh, to spend a few minutes with us today. So today we have a, a great topic, <clears throat> excuse me. We're gonna take a look at how process automation can really make a difference uh, when it comes to incident request management in terms of really delivering services in the real world. So you know, what does that really mean? We're gonna unpack that. Uh, so we have a great session lined up for you, especially, you know, this is an important topic when everyone's really trying to look at ways to look, uh, ways to look and work smarter and faster and drive better efficiencies and productivity. So process automation is a key component to that, obviously. So with us today, uh, taking us through the presentation and demo is Ed Luna. Some of you have probably already uh, either met Ed worked with him over the last uh, few years. Uh, he's been in the business, you know, for 20 plus years. So he brings a breadth of, uh, of, of knowledge uh, around infrastructure and architecture management. And he's been with uh, CA for quite a few years, and he is definitely one of our experts when it comes to process automation. So we're absolutely glad to have him uh, on the presentation on the WebEx today. And again, before we get started. Uh, we are recording uh, this session, so it will be posted back to the community. I think that typically takes uh, 24 hours. So if any of your peers uh, could not participate or, or be a part of this uh, session, uh, we can send the link to them or, you know, be sure to let them know that the link will be posted. They could actually uh, listen in on the session. Uh, also, we will be taking uh, questions through our Q&A uh, feature. So if you do have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to ask questions. Um, and as Chris mentioned at the top of the call, if you, you know, are on an open line, if you could keep your phones muted, uh, that would be helpful uh, in case uh, if there's any kind of background noise. So with that, um, looking forward to uh, answering any questions that we do have uh, from the audience. Uh, again, this is a, another uh, one in a series of a uh, number of Meet the Experts uh, webcasts that we have planned. Stay tuned in the community. Um, there's one more that we have planned coming up next month, just to give you guys an FYI, around ITAM. So uh, be, be on the lookout for that as well. So with that, I'm going to go ahead, and he's going to go ahead and kick things off for us. Ed, I think it's all yours. Thank you, Jim. Good morning, everyone. Can, uh, Jim, can you see my press? Just uh, making sure. I, yep, sure can. All right. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Jim, for the introduction. Uh, as Jim mentioned, um, I've been I've been with TA close to 10 years now, working on this product of uh, process automation. Been in the industry over 21 years. Uh, and, you know, encompassing infrastructure, uh, architecture, the uh, application delivery, and all other aspects of the. Uh, Enterprise. Um, so, without further ado, we're, we're going to go through the, the session. We'll cover, you know, some key points around where process automation can enable you, uh, enable you in regards to how we can gain, uh, you know, more traction in automating, orchestrating activities in the back end of your service desk or in the back end of your service catalog through fulfillment or closed loop into the management. Meantime, to resolution, uh, some to the demonstrations will route that I am gonna to provide today, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll depict that. Uh, we'll go through a little overview, uh, enterprise use case value, and the demo, and some success stories. So, uh, you know, as, as, as the industry matures and, and folks have gone off and done various projects and, 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 and working towards trying to optimize and continually uh, improve their service delivery. Uh, what we're seeing now in the industry today is, you know, a significant amount of most of the uh, enterprises live here, live here where they've done, there's still a lot of manual happening, many activities, tasks happening, a lot of scripting efforts that, successful scripting efforts, and a lot of pockets of automation around VMware, server provisioning, uh, maybe uh, through the monitoring, uh, automating the ticket generations and things of that nature. So there has been a lot of good work that is leading to the next, uh, the next stage 
of your maturity, which is enterprise orchestration. That's where PAM will enable you either to fulfill what you've been doing here and then bridging the gap to here, leveraging, you know, you know, the existing investments that you have within catalog or service desk. So what, what's that enterprise orchestration? You know, as you all know, we're all going through increased changes, mandates, and security-focused type activities. So there's a lot of things that are happening around us, as well as we need to uh, continually manage the environment. Uh, so in order to help the situation or help, uh, you know, streamline the processes that exist, uh, Processor gives you the ability to do the following. Um, enables you to, to gain repeatability, repeatability of the processes that you've already adopted, the pockets of automation that you've already introduced into the environment, and, and just bringing everything together, bringing in the processes and the steps that already exist, modeling into the orchestration engine. Uh, orchestration engine enables you to leverage true data sources, like true data sources could be the service desk itself, it could be CMDB, it could be monitoring. It could be your catalog. It could be various types of data sources that enable you to bring in data to, to, to trigger processes, to make decisions. And, and so, you know, that these, these three elements will enable you to gain repeatability, the true data source, the integration points within those processes, as well as, you know, encapsulating, you know, um, those processes to make them more repeatable. And what, what that repeatability leads to is consistency in the processes themselves, the individual steps, the end to end. So think about what it takes to mean time to resolution, the, the initial trigger of an of a, of a incident or alarm that triggers activities for triage, opening up tickets. There's various inputs that could be. Or maybe it's just server request provisioning. Maybe it's a catalog request that leads to the end-to-end -end fulfillment of presenting a new infrastructure and environment to a business service for development purposes. So if you think about what all the groups that are involved and all the manual tasks that might exist and the disparate systems that need data from each other, that's what we're trying to, that's the problem that we're trying to solve. That's the problem that we're trying to help streamline that, those types of activities and, and achieve consistency through the process themselves, through and gaining results in the individual steps, as well as consistency in the results of the overall processes. And how we do that is by consistency, how we're going to provide the processes data, how we're, how we're going to in, uh, uh, extract the, the data outputs that exist through each individual step, as well as the outputs of the individual processes or the end-to-end -end process. This all equals predictability. predictability enables you to have true metrics to measure by, real data to measure by, and more importantly, known outcomes, right? And, and this all leads to optimization. This is, this is not nirvana. This is, we have many, many customers have reached this goal. They've ex expedited through the, their maturity, and they've uh, introduced process automation, leveraging their existing investments through catalog or service desk to achieve what we're talking about here in this, in this presentation. So where, where we stand here in process automation, we kind of highlight a couple of familiar use cases to everyone here. These use cases all touch or interact with service management in some, in, at some level, through patch management, through alert suppression, closed loop incident management, application delivery, job scheduling. Every aspect of these use cases touch, in, touch some sort of interaction with service management. And here's where process automation kind of sits enabling you to make these use cases, these enterprise level use cases, more repeatable, more consistent, more predictable at the end of the day. At the same time, providing that audit trail, that end-to-end -end visibility, and closely aligning ourselves with the service management components that exist, like your CMDB, your incident management, or your request for so many change processes. So how do we do it? We, today, we, what process automation essentially does is encapsulates and integrates the people that exist in these processes, the processes themselves, and more importantly, the technology. Now, there's going to be areas where the technology um, 
has not evolved yet. It has, automation doesn't exist yet. So we understand that that might happen, but that doesn't mean they can't be part of the automation or the orchestration. They can't be a part of the overall end-to-end. -end. So we can introduce uh, areas of where automation isn't uh, real yet, right? But, it, but process automation enables you to eventually add yourself to these type of processes, the automated, once your, your integration is existing, once your process is mature enough, so you can add yourself at any time. That flexibility does exist within PAM in a federated model to add your content to an existing process. Well, that may, day one may be, may be manual, day two may be automated. So once again, we kind of sit ourselves right in the, in the center of the enterprise uh, on the infrastructure side, more, uh, more importantly, where we're kind of uh, stitching together the data that exists that is necessary for the various infrastructures that play a role in, in every discipline that you see here on the screen. I might, I might be missing some disciplines, but essentially these are the main players of, of your enterprise on the op side. And, and one of the use cases that I always kind of run through is thinking of, you know, say your job scheduling environment is going to need, or just any business service environment for that matter, that is going to need, need more capacity because we have a big event. We need more resources to handle this uh, this uh, unexpected load. So that right there kind of triggers that we need more server provision, we need more uh, resource provision. We need the standard configurations for configuration management to provision the, those resources. Change management needs to be engaged so we can have change control to um, to to introduce these new resources into production. Help desk always needs to be a part of, even though it's automated, there's still a audit trail, there's still tasks that are assigned to this automation that needs to be, um, that needs to be in, uh, ingested into the tickets associated with the activities. And then lastly, network operations needs to be involved because they need to know about the new resources that might be online in their network. So as you can see, all these disciplines and that simple use case that happens quite often, I'm sure, in your organization, needs data from each other. They need to need visibility that what's happening from one step to another. And that's what, that's what process automation essentially delivers, is attaching the, the, and stitching together the, the process, the steps, the data that drives these processes in order to deliver whatever that service is to the various types of resources that you can see down below. Some of the value areas that you get when you start orchestrating, you start moving towards or orchestrating your activities, right? Today, you, today just, just, just so you're aware, well, process automation, if you're not aware, of course, the process automation already lives in your environment and, and if you're a service desk or a catalog customer handling workflow aspects. But many of my customers have already take that next step, that next step of evolution, that next step of progression to start taking advantage of orchestrating and, and, and initiating those those manual tasks today, like maybe running triage scripts, maybe actually kicking off uh, server provision and, 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 and other various tasks that live in your organization, right? Uh, and some of the luxury that you get when process automation starts driving those processes is process control and resiliency. And this is quite honestly a differentiator as over any orchestration engine. It enables you to manage exceptions. So it's for, for the purposes of, you know, of orchestration, it's very, in automation, it's very easy to automate the happy path, I call it, right? When everything works the way you want it. You can touch a database when you want it. You want to make a web service call. You want to run a script. Everything works the way you want it. But that's not really reality. Sometimes things do go awry. Some things do happen within the organization. Something may time out. So process automation gives you some control and resiliency on how do you manage through that exception, right? All, you know, out of the box, enable you to go down an exception path, notify who needs to re resolve that particular problem. Maybe it's, I can't touch the database, right? We can even go as far as remediating that, you know, trying to maybe, maybe it's a service that's down. Maybe we all we need to do is re uh, restart that service, and then we can get back to the happy path. So that's the luxury of process automation. Without any additional logic, you know, we can, get you back to that, to the employee process right where you left off and continue to use all the data that was already been gathered. So if you're thinking about it, a hundred step change control processes, right? A uh, hundred step 
process, something goes wrong in step 55. You've already opened up tickets in the first 55 steps. You've already introduced the alarm IDs or the requests and the data, maybe it's IP addresses, various data that you've already gathered. Do you want to just throw that away? No, you want to be able to re-leverage it. So that process automation enables you to have that by, by suspending the process, remediating it, and coming back where we left off and, re and reusing all the data that has already been gathered. The second point is um, security framework. So we're a believer that, you know, on day one, yeah, you're going to have a process automation uh, group that's going to be spawned off from some one of your groups, and they're going to be responsible for designing these processes, coordinating the integrations and things of that nature. But we also allow you in a federated model to open the doors to those types of that content or that not that knowledge base or tribal knowledge that exists within all these groups. Allow them to be the content admin. That's that's an evolution. That's that's where we can take you to, where other groups can provide the content and attach their content to existing processes. Now the third point, integration capabilities. Obviously we have plenty of integration capabilities and various mechanisms to do to talk to talk to West Services, CLI, run scripts. And so, and we'll talk today's basis. But more importantly, we give you an enterprise integration layer and an operational view to the end-to-end -end process to see in this process what infrastructure is being interacted at the time. Maybe we need to something's happening in VMware. Maybe we're looking at storage. Maybe we're looking at monitoring. So you have visibility of this interaction today, based on. Um, uh, disparate system and those that orchestration not existing, you might have to make a phone call. You might have to email somebody to understand where am I in this process? What, you know, are, why is it taking so long to deliver this VM? Or why, why is this service down? These are, this is all type of visibility that can be at your fingertips by allowing process automation to orchestrate these type of activities. And, one, and the last point is, is our uh, architectural flexibility and scalability. This is where we really hang our hat on. We're, we're very mature in this uh, space. We've been around for quite a long time, 10 years, I think now, uh, eight years since uh, CA has uh, acquired, uh, acquired uh, process automation. But, you know, we've always been able to be very flexible in, in how we uh, can handle uh, our own infrastructure, how flexible we can scale to various types of workloads in your enterprise. And a good example is how well we work alongside your job scheduling uh, infrastructure, how well we can, you know, work with a, such a time-sensitive, workload-intensive type of processes. You know, the last thing you'd want is your job scheduling to have, to have a bottleneck because of their uh, orchestration engine, it, it can't keep up. So that's one of the things that we do really well and scale to that type of workload, as well as handle, you know, small type of run books and be able to scale to complex, uh, you know, multi-channel type of processes that might exist in your environment. And one last note on, on scalability, how we scale in regards to the various use cases that we support. You know, we can, as, as I mentioned before, patch process, working along with job scheduling, request fulfillment for server provisioning, maybe it's identity management type of processes, you know, mean time to resolution type of process around alert suppression. You know, the list goes on. And that kind of leads to this slide, and, and I'm sure that all these use cases are very familiar to you. And I'm proud to say that every one of these use cases today exists somewhere in, my, in, in our customer base. Some process automation customer is doing this, is, is, has one of, these process, one of these use cases in production and gaining value off of them. And real quick, a couple more slides, then we'll get into a quick demonstration and some success stories, and then we'll open the door up for some questions. Um, so real quickly, uh, here are the functional elements of process automation. It's not a gigantic solution suite of products. It's, this is what comes with the product. It, it's, it has the automation designer. It enables you to model your existing processes into the solution, leveraging definitely uh, different objects that exist, like your, the processes themselves various types of forms, you know, start request forms, uh, user interaction forms, user interaction forms are, are that component that allows you to continue to have manual intervention involved as part of the process if necessary. 
uh, data sets, you know, various levels of data sets, most importantly, enabling you to externalize the data, the data within a, uh, a global type of data set, you know, uh, handling type of uh, data like credentials and, and things of that nature. Uh, all these objects and content and integrations live in an automation library. That automation library is a uh, check-in, check-out perspective and version control out of the box. So now you have a way of managing the content and no edits, nothing can be done without checking it out and checking it back in and providing you a version. A good example of this that quickly can gain value in your organization is existing scripts. We know that they live out there and we know that they do a good job, but now we can give you a, a way of enhancing those scripts. We'll say PowerShell scripts or Unix scripts. We can put them in a script operator within PAM and enable you to dynamically add data uh, to those scripts uh, you know, dynamically in, in the sense that we can access true data sources, that we can bring in data to those scripts easily. Uh, we can encapsulate those scripts, dummy them down so people that, that uh, wrote the scripts don't do, have necessarily have to be a part of the design process. They just, uh, you know, maybe designers can un understand, oh, this is a script that does an NS lookup, or this is a script that does a triage. And all that's exposed to them is maybe some, some parameters that drive the script. They don't have to be a PowerShell expert or a Perl expert to, do, to, to create these processes. So that's another luxury that you get when you start bringing in scripts. And now you have also a means to manage those scripts and now allow people to go in there and make changes to those scripts without some type of audit trail, checking in and checking out and, and versioning. Uh, the lifecycle manager is the operational view. It enables you to see where processes are and what state they might be in uh, end to end, you know, from the parent process to the child process that might be spawned off. And the last component is our, is our orchestrator. Orchestrator is the component that does the, the heavy lifting. Does, it's the component that does the web services call, kicks off the scripts, talks JDBC to the databases, SSH to, to the network devices. So it's the component that does all that heavy lifting and, 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 uh, and execution. We also have, uh, we also have agent. Uh, the majority of our things are done agent with space through the orchestrator, but there is, there is cases where we, we may recommend an agent to be uh, installed in, certain, in, in a certialized location. Uh, a good example would be maybe, um, maybe we were part of our process, we're querying a database and, and the query takes 90 minutes has nothing to do with process automation, it's just that's how long the query takes. It takes a while to, to go uh, run that query. And rather than having an orchestrator waiting for that process or that step to finish, why don't we put a, an orchestrator on the database so we can wait. It takes, in the, it takes the, the instructions from the orchestrator and it waits and then reports back to the orchestrator. That alleviates the load that you have on your orchestrator because your orchestrator is often doing a lot of other different things and that's a good you know, tactical way of you know, minimizing how much load you're going to have and posing it back to the local uh, endpoints that might exist within the process. Real quick, use case value, and we're, we're going to get into the demo. Um, first demo is going to be kind of revolving around this. This is what you know, mean time to resolution alert suppression kind of looks like in your world today. You know, a lot of different handoffs, different people involved different infrastructure. Yeah, you know, side by side by side comparison to that, today this is what it may look like. With process automation it may look like this. As you can see a, a significant time savings, right? Um, once we move on to the next step and the next step. And more importantly, not just the time saving, the amount of people it takes to 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 manage this. Those subject matter experts can be off taking care of maybe let's think about it this way, you know, level you know level one, uh, critical one, severity one type of, uh, of problems, or severity two. Let's get rid of all those severity fours and severity threes, because those are probably known issues that happen all the time. But while we automate them, because we already have adopted run books that know how to fix those. So that's a good way of, not, you know, reducing the time to mean time to resolution, reduce the time, it, you know, people have to invest in, in medial tasks, uh, so there's all kinds of benefits around on, on that alone. Now, in another uh, in another scenario, in another demo that I'm going to provide you is in the request fulfillment, you know, server provisioning type of use case. 
you know, using your catalog and, and be able to have services already defined, have customers go in and use your customers go in there, go into a simple form, request resources, and be able to provision. This is what it looks like today. Once again, many people involved, many infrastructures involved, you know, disparate systems not talking to each other. So this is, you know, this is why this, most of the time these, these type of process took any from, anywhere from six weeks to six months depending on how large and how complex the environment we're provisioning. You know, so we'll go again, side by side comparison where we can, where we can shave off time, shave off who needs to be involved through integrations, through passing data, through integrations, more time savings, redirecting these resources. Think about who's involved in doing these tasks today. Very high, highly skilled individuals that can be maybe uh, you know, refocused in providing more innovative solutions to your enterprise so you can grow your own business rather than worrying about how to provision VMs, how to install SQL, or how to configure load balancers or, or things of that nature, things that you do quite honestly uh, time and time again, very repeatable process that exist. They can be easily automated and, and part of the process. So that kind of leads to my demonstration. So the first thing that I'm going to, uh, the first demonstration I'm going to show is um, is the meantime to, res actually, let me start off with uh, with the catalog. So what you see here, we're in a C8 service catalog. Uh, it can look real pretty like this uh, with a bunch of services, uh, you know, parent service defined. You can drill into here to IIS service and that kind of leads to a bunch of different child services. All right, if I go back to home, you can notice that we have uh, one service that's in flight. This service was kicked off by Team Monroe, and it's pending approval. So, so we want to maybe take, now we, it's, it's already been re redirected to my manager. That manager needs to uh, take on that approval, right? So if we look at the catalog itself, we already see that Rita Jones is, has this in her queue, and she needs to do something needs to approve this request. So if I go ahead and log out real quick and log in as Rita Jones, right, and Rita Jones has a request pending here, two requests actually, but the top one is the one we're concerned with. Before I kick this thing off and, and actually approve it, I just want to show you a little back end of what's happening. Uh, what's happening. So right now, uh, I've already I already submitted the form just to, for the sake of time, uh, and it's sitting here in, in Rita Jones' queue. So as soon as I go ahead and, and approve this, and now right now what it's doing, it's kind of thinking it's going to go ahead and and move the, the process along, okay, it's moved it over, now it's going ahead, it's past that waiting stage, and now what we're going to take a quick look at is in process automation, we now have a new process, policy removal is out, policy, the approval process already has, and now we have a process that's actually performing the, the task of provisioning a, a, a VMware server. So we. First thing we do is we grab the um, the data from all the form, uh, all the all the fields of the form. Uh, so this is right here. I'd like to point this out. This piece right here is a repeatable and reusable content. Every one of your processes that you would use would use exactly this type of same type of content, and it allows you to bring in the data quickly. And then you can put it right in front of a VMware provisioning process or whatever process that you want to define as a service. So if we take a look at my VMware server real quick, so you know that I'm, I don't, that, that process has been kicked off. And it's now provisioning a, a server. So that's going to take, a, that's going to take some time. But, so we're going to go ahead and move on to the next use case. The next use case is going, is revolved around um, closed loop incident management, alert suppression, mean time to resolution, right? So we're in our monitoring solution. I'm just going to go ahead and force a, uh, Force a breach, a threshold breach, and just to give you a little idea of what's happened, but also some of the other things that we're looking at is that we're monitoring a, uh, a uh, two-node cluster. Uh, there's a disk problem, 
and we're going to go ahead and force that. And we're going to take some sustainability actions. We're going to do some remediation. We're going to open some tickets. We're going to do all kinds of things that, um, that today probably may be very manual in your organization. So let me go ahead and, and trigger process automation. So you saw me trigger process automation in my first demo through a catalog request. Now you're going to see process automation being triggered just based on an alarm threshold breach. I'm going to kick that off. That automatically sends a, um, a, a, a trigger to our process automation. As you can see, now we have a disk utilization response in here. It's on a breakpoint because I want to talk to you a little bit about what's going to happen and also where, where you might find value here. So we kind of, I just drilled into a live instance that was kicked off through the uh, alarm ID I mean, the, the, from uh, the Spectrum alarm. And it brings us right to the, uh, to the designer. This is where we model exactly what we do in our process today. So if you want to take a step back and think about what do I do when alarm does go off? Do I open up a ticket? How do I open that ticket? Do I kick off based on the alarm? Is there some, uh, some run books that need to kick off? Uh, triage processes, gather, gathering more data. Uh, do I even do any sustainability, like uh, remove the node out of a load balancer? Uh, do I even try to remediate? Maybe it's a, it's a stop service, or maybe I want to clean up the disk. So there's all kinds of things that might happen in your world today that you would model into, the, into process automation, right? Leveraging, you know, the various connectors that we have uh, that you see here. As you can see, we can have a service desk connector, spectrum connector, and other third-party type connectors as well. Uh, what's happening here is we're at a breakpoint. We're bringing it, we're going to bring in the alarm ID. Right? We're going to take that alarm right day. We're going to create a, uh, a ticket. Now, today, you might have your tickets being opened directly from Spectrum through, uh, through other mechanisms, and, that, and that's fine. That doesn't necessarily mean you can't take advantage of PAM here. PAM could be ingested here, where we can take this information and, and be triggered from the service desk to do some triage. So we can add some steps here to go, go triage. Maybe I need some log information from Splunk. Maybe I need so maybe it's a, a Java environment, so I want to gather some information from uh, application performance management, some you know, some performance metrics. So there's things that can happen here as well, right? So we're gonna go ahead and resume this process and let it do what it needs, let it do its thing. It's gonna go open up a ticket and service desk. And once it opens the ticket, it's gonna update the alarm and then it's gonna do a sustainability uh, all right so it opened the ticket and here's the data I was talking about we're always gathering data right alarm ID stuff or and here's a ticket so if I go ahead here 5973 right and right now we're, we've already um, removed a load uh, one of the nodes that are load balancer because this 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 particular server is having problems so we don't want to and, uh, impact our end users. So let's let's take the traffic from it, and until somebody has a chance to look at it. So we have, we had to spawned off a, a child process that went ahead and removed one of the nodes out of the load balancer. So let's go ahead and take a look at some things first. To show you what happened in the back end. So we're going to take that 5973 ticket, right? We'll go to my service desk. But first, I want to I want to show you that we've already removed cluster node one out of my load balancer. I no longer receiving traffic. So that's, that's process automation making some, uh, some decisions based on the alarm, based on the fact we can't, this is not going to be easily resolved or, or whatever the case may be. But that's logic and processes that you, you know how to do. So if we go over here and go to uh, service desk and we log into our service desk screen, And I put 5973 in here. As you can see, it's already been it's uh, updated. And, and and to point another thing, if I were to run some triage and that helps me identify who really owns this, I can change the the incident area. 
I can change through the affected user. I can make some dynamic changes to this ticket through process automation in order to get get that ticket in the, in the right group's hands. So that's one of the things that that we help that we really help is, is in regards to re redirecting the ticket, leveraging some additional triage data. That's that's the huge value of process automation. So we'll go back to our process and resume it again. It you know removed it. Now it's going to try to clean up the problem and then once it, it's going to try to remediate here by cleaning up the disk. Then it's going to make a decision. It's going to um, it's going to take a look at this expression, evaluate it. If it meets that criteria, it'll go down that path. If it meets this criteria, it'll go down this path. So there's various ways to make decisions in PAM. This happens to be one of the probably one of the easiest ways. Is we're going to go ahead and uh, try to clean up the disk. So it spawns off this child process. We go in here and we take a look at what's going on here. It's got it already try to clean up, and then over here it's going to evaluate it, and then it's going to make a decision. So let's get, so let's figure out, let's see what's going to do here. And if it goes down this path, it goes okay. So it didn't fix the problem. So if it would have fixed the problem, it would have went down this swim lane where it uh, it you know restores the load balancer, it closes the ticket, it clears the alarm, and we're done, right? Um, but since it's still having a problem, it updated the ticket and updated the alarm. So and you can you can add more logic or another process to escalate uh, to notifications and stuff like that. But that that this update in the ticket would probably handle most of that uh, escalation anyway. Um, and that kind of let's just take a little quick peek at my uh, servers. My servers already provisioned, and so that that catalog was probably almost done. But let's see. Let's take a peek. It. Yeah, fulfillment. It's pending fulfillment, so it hasn't completed yet, but that's okay. Um, that kind of concludes my demonstration. I just got a couple of success stories, and then we can open up the lines to some questions and answers. So, last couple of uh, just kind of want to uh, show some of our customers who are taking advantage of uh, process automation as well as our service management suite. Uh, large bank. Using our catalog uh, and PAM together, very, I wouldn't say simple problem, but probably a very common problem within the banks when in the years when they were merging with all other banks, they have a collection of tools. In this case, it was a bunch of job schedulers, and they needed to have a centralized interface to have their end users go in there and request ad hoc job scheduling, uh, make changes to the job environment. But they had an interface with six different job schedulers. So that's where we put uh, catalog right in front of that, and Pam did all the decision making based on the data that was fed to the form. And that that, that simple use case, you know, equated to three million dollars annual operational savings. My next customer, um, they spoke here. They they're very popular to us because the gentleman that uh, presents, he always says that process automation is his most important employee, and and it's really telling when he's when he's talking about, he's very passionate when he's talking about this particular use case because it's a very business critical or very mission critical type of use case. It informs uh, victims when, when you, know, um, you know, people are being let out of uh, prison and things of that nature, notifying them that to be on alert. So it's very important if you think about it. And, this, and, the, and the solution that helped them solve that problem is a service desk as well as process automation. Um, the, you know, the challenge was there's many silos, specialized products, you know, those disparate systems, those manual processes, and being able to stitch it all together and streamline those processes. Those streamlined processes equated to value to the customer. Today, they perform over 100, 140,000 orchestrations per month and, quite honestly, uh, $1.75 million of soft costs. Another one of our service desk customers, it was all about uh, compliance to them, being able to have that audit trail, that repeatable process, that enabled them to have to to uh, hold off auditors, give them the data they needed in order to report on uh, compliance type of um, questions. And then lastly, uh, serve another, a service catalog customer started off with four services. They are uh, just was. I just had the pleasure of uh, talking with them at our user group, um, and.
and they, they are grown to 96 services. So they're using our catalog and process automation to deliver various services from server provisioning, VMware rights, um, v, VMware type of provisioning, um, uh, operational management, and, and so on. And that ends my presentation. I will, Jim, you can open the door to questions. Thank you. Hey, great job, Ed. Uh, yeah, we do have a few questions that have, uh, have come in, and uh, I'll just read them to you. Maybe you can, uh, sure. at the same time, take a look at some of these. But uh, one uh, one of the questions that has come in is uh, that, you know, in terms of the, the tool itself, it seems to be, you know, obviously pretty robust. It's powerful, um, but it does require a higher level of knowledge and, and development kind of from a programming standpoint. Uh, the question is, you know, what are we doing from a CA standpoint to, to help make those those integrations a little easier to use, specifically with uh, with SDM? That's great. That's a great question. Yeah. So we're we we've heard loud and clear that we that there's um, there's some there's some content that we need to provide. Uh, we're we're promoting our community. With, we're we're starting to we're starting to introduce a uh, a methodology around GitHub or some mechanism to, to collaborate, as well as we're updating our training to introduce a little bit more advanced type of training, and, and as well as you know so between us seeding our community with more content and how tos and how to do these kind of things, uh, you know collaboration uh, allowing everyone in our customer base to share. Uh, and, and updating our training, these I feel, we feel that these are the best ways that we can help our customers. Right. Um, kind of dovetailing into that, and, and you know, I would I would also say that I know that there's an emphasis on, on the product side from a product management standpoint uh, to really look at a kind of better together story um, in terms of you know unifying technologies. Uh, adjacent, you know, obviously PAM being an, uh, an adjacent technology that, that's leveraged on, you know, from a service desk perspective. So uh, I don't have that answer yet, um, but uh, hopefully, you know, the, the team can get together and kind of uh, take a look at this particular area and see if there's anything that we can do to make things easier for, for our customers. Um, there also, there was a question about pre-built workflows in, in 12.x. Uh, Specifically mm -hmm. around SEM service catalog, ITAM. Uh, did those? Did those? I guess the other qu the question here is also from a configuration management standpoint. Did those workflows are they still available for use? Do you know? Ed, you there? Well, it looks like uh, we lost Ed, uh, Chris. So I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, I was yeah say, I think uh, he just sent an email. They lost power. Okay. Um, well, I, my my suggestion is I, I know we've got some questions that are coming in uh, through the line. Questions are you know great uh, comments, concerns about uh, you know the interface itself. I think those are all being kind of taken to heart um, and looked at. Uh, obviously, I, I can't speak to timelines and roadmap, um, but I know that uh, those comments uh, will definitely get back to product management. Um, there was one other question, examples, uh, ticket change. Yeah, unfortunately, without Ed here, it will be difficult to kind of answer the question, so I do apologize uh, to everyone on the phone who does have questions, but what I would and maybe what we can do, Chris, is um, maybe we can get these questions to Ed and we can post the answers or responses back to the community. Would that be okay? That would certainly work. We can do that. Okay. So we'll, we'll capture these. Um, so for those that are out there, and again, I appreciate the questions. We will try to get answers to those questions to you as quickly as possible. Uh, I'd like to say thank you uh, to Ed. Uh, you know, given, given the nature of the technology uh, and the time that we have, hopefully that was informative. I would like to also add that uh, 
uh, you know, the future webcasts in our Meet the Experts series, uh, you know, they're posted to the community, so please take a look at those. Um, the next one coming up is uh, specifically around ITAM, uh, so we hope to see you there, and uh, we'll be posting more to the community as we go along. So I'd like to say thank you on behalf of uh, Ed, myself, and, and Chris. Uh, we'll be talking to you soon, and I uh, hope everyone hey. has a great rest of the day. Hey, Jim, Jim, it yes. looks like Ed may back on. Oh, Ed is back on? Hey, Ed? It looks like he's coming on. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is all real time. Let's, let's give him a let's give him a second and see if his phone line connects. Yeah. Hopefully we're not dropping too many people here. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. Something tells me that's J-Dub. <laughs> hey, Jim. Ed, how are hey, you? Hey, Jim. I, I, I don't know. We just lost power here. Okay. Hopefully it's nothing too serious. So hopefully not. It's, it's still like gray. <laughs> okay, that's yeah. <laughs> Great. Hey, listen, uh, Ed, so while we have you, we did have a few questions that uh, that did come up, um, and uh, they, they were specifically, the, the question that I was asking you specifically was about some of the pre-built workflows in service management uh, in 14.1 uh, for SDM, Service Catalog, ICAM, and that there's also some configuration management workflows in 12.x and 12.9, 12.5 and 12.9. Do you know if those workflows are still available? They are. They're part of the ITIL content pack, and I believe we're, uh, yeah, we're, we're working to even to show you how to use those. That's part of the training that we're talking about. Our services folks are working towards helping uh, organizations um, uh, be able to leverage that type of content and show you how to use it in, in more advanced type of training classes in, in process automation. Okay, and I would assume that that probably would uh, also answer this next question specifically around VMware and, and kind of the interactions integrations with VMware. I know there was some concern about, uh, you know, the, uh, the documentation. Um, I guess my, my recommendation would obviously, you know, to be able to, you know, call the service desk and, and hopefully log a ticket to try to get, you know, better documentation or specific answers around the integrations that they're trying to deploy. Um, but I would, uh, we'll be sure to actually send this on to uh, the documentation teams and, and to the service teams as well. Um, what about, uh, see, there's another uh, question here from Gonzalo, so that there's a short list of connectors, the roadmap, uh, the current list is growing. Are there more connectors coming or in play? Do you know? Yes, stay tuned. We're, we, we've heard, uh, we've heard that. Uh, we're, 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 we're talking about the, we're trying to seed the community with a lot of more connectors, um, with how to's associated to those connectors. Uh, we're, we're, that, we're working towards that. We've heard, we've heard a lot of, uh, in fact, we've heard it from our user group meetings as well as from our community. Uh, we've, we've definitely heard your, you, uh, loud and clear. We, there's connectors coming. Okay. Uh, let's see, another question here, I think we, we kind of answered a, a few documentation questions, so yeah, I guess the, the answer there is stay tuned. Um, is there, can you discuss any, the limitations uh, with PAM connecting to non-CA uh, sources from a, from a licensing standpoint? Is there any insight you can provide? Uh, well, the, so um, in that regards, if you want, there is two levels of licensing. Um, so PAM is sold with various uh, CA solutions like Service Desk and Service Catalog, and there's a uh, you know a limited uh, limited entitlement in regards to the type of integrations you can create with third parties. Like for instance, 
say you're a catalog user and you want to have a bi-directional integration with a, uh, another provider's service desk, right? Um, so that, that's a ex good example of, uh, you know, you want to be able to communicate back and forth. That you would need a standalone license for. If you wanted to maintain everything that's happening within service desk as a workflow, that doesn't entitle you to that. So there's a standalone license for that kind of activity. But on a technology perspective, there is no limitations whatsoever. Either we have no, we have no uh, concept of this, if you're a service desk customer, PAM can't do this on a technology perspective. It's really about a licensing entitlement. Does that make sense? Got it. I, I believe so. Hopefully that answered the question. Um, let's see, I'm just going through the list here, some more documentation. I think we addressed that. Um, I think that's answered all the questions so far. Anyone have any additional questions? Uh, there's just a few minutes left. So if you do have any additional questions, please uh, use the Q&A uh, feature. And I don't think there are any additional questions. Okay, great. Any, uh, any, you, any uh, final comments? Uh, I was gonna, I was gonna say that uh, I pretty much signed off earlier. But uh, do you have any final comments? Any, um, any last thoughts? No, uh, that's it. I appreciate everyone for joining. Uh, hopefully, you found this useful, and uh, feel free to reach out to me. Fantastic. All right, thanks everyone. I uh, just want to say thanks again. Myself, uh, thanks for joining. Uh, all great questions. Um, I, I think you know the takeaway here is that we will send these uh, these comments, these questions back to the product teams themselves, so that obviously they get uh, they understand your voice, your concerns, um, and hopefully drive that back into the product. As I mentioned, uh, stay tuned to the community. We do have future webcasts coming up. Uh, and we hope to see you there. So with that, I'll say again, <laughs> uh, guys have a great uh, rest of your day, and uh, we will be talking to you soon. Thanks, everyone.